Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. I want to thank you for joining us here today for this virtual event presented by IFLA's Cultural Heritage Program Advisory Committee on Libraries Inspiring Engagement in Cultural Heritage. Before we begin, I would like to bring to your attention that portions of this event will be recorded. We will try to have time for questions at the end, so please use the Q&A box to ask any that you may have throughout the presentations. My name is Claire McGuire, speaking to you from IFLA headquarters, where I work on matters related to cultural heritage policy and advocacy. I've been helping the advisory committee deliver this program, which seeks to share different perspectives on how memory institutions facilitate interaction with their collections and help their audiences engage meaningfully with cultural heritage. We have invited four very exciting speakers from all different types of memory institutions to join us for this event and share their experience, both working with their institution's collections themselves, as well as with their visitors, with community groups, and with the larger public, to help people experience, appreciate, learn from, and share cultural heritage. Following the presentations, we will have a brief discussion and, if time allows, an opportunity to ask a few questions. The goal of our event is to help you think about how, in your practice, you might find different ways to inspire engagement with and access to cultural heritage of all kinds. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Lara Haggerty is the library manager and keeper of the books at Inner Periphery Library in Scotland. She will speak to you on connecting locally to cultural heritage. Lara, over to you. The library here at Inner Pefri was the very first free public lending library in Scotland, um, probably in Great Britain. It was lending books from 1680 until 1968, so almost 300 years of lending. And as you can see from the picture, we are situated in a very rural place, um, a part of Scotland um, called Perthshire, which is right in the geographic centre of the country and on the edge of the Highlands. Our nearest town is six miles or 10 kilometres away. When lending ceased at Inner Pefri, the library was in limbo for a while, but now, although it is a very small place, uh, it has a dual role as a museum and tourist attraction combined with a reference library and research centre. And in this way, we aim um, to stay true to our founder's wish, which was a, a vision to make the collection available to people, to be of benefit to people. And that was what he said when he set it up. Now, this vision is the first thing that touches people and it touches people across the world. And whether they see it as an egalitarian notion or a philanthropic act. The idea of knowledge being freely available to everyone was at the time of Inner Pefri's founding a, a very unusual, in fact, almost a radical one. And it's something that we emphasize today when we're doing our guided tours in our literature and because it is so emotive and I think it's not too much to say important, an important vision. Could I have the next slide, please, Claire? Now, Inner Pefri's Borrowers Register is our greatest treasure. It records the people who borrowed books from 1747, when we started writing it down, right up until the end of lending in 1968. In the top image, you can see a two page spread from volume one, where the locals would write a promise, a promise that they would return their book and safe and unspoiled, so they haven't um, messed it up. Now, they would give the, na the name of the book, uh, the date, their name and address, and often their occupation as well. So as you can imagine, this is an incredible document for library historians. But what we found is that it is also an astonishing collection of information for family historians. And that's where our next connection comes in. In 2010, I met a, a gentleman called uh, Bob McRobbie, and he was from Pennsylvania in the United States. And he was on a visit to Scotland with his family because they wanted to see where his ancestors had come from. Now, the family had emigrated to the US in 1813, and he was tracing their story. Now, 
the touring the area in Perthshire, they came um, across Inner Peffrey because they were looking at graveyards. Now we're quite used to this because we have a graveyard beside us as well. And they found us almost by accident. At this time, we had no analysis of our register, or I should say a very minimal analysis of it. We had no database of it, we had no um, digitization, but we were able to find the entry that you can see at the bottom of the page, which says that James McRobbie, a tailor in Inner Paffrey, borrowed Perkins volume two in 1752. Now my visitor, Bob, was overwhelmed. Uh, his great, 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 great grandfather's handwriting was in our book. And it told us where he was living um, and it told us what he was reading. And Bob could actually hold that book in his hands because I found Perkins volume two, took it down off the shelf and let him hold it. And we both learned about James. He was nearly married. He was working in the textile industry and he took the time to visit the library and take home a book about how to live a good Christian life, which is what Perkins is all about. Now, this accident, as it was, taught me a very important lesson. It wasn't just that we needed to do more research about our borrower's register, which we obviously did. Um, but that lesson was about the appeal of the tangible, the story that you can touch. We still keep in touch with the McRobbies. Um, who have their family Bible proudly displayed in the States at their Family History Centre, which is the final picture on this slide. Um, and this experience led us to develop a regular display of stories within the borrower's register. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, this is a snap of our current display. So the big white splodges are the lights from above. I couldn't stop them reflecting on the screen, so apologies for that. Our Meet the Borrower display started as a simple way to explain the library's history, and it developed with the arrival of Jill Dye to do her PhD on Inner Peffrey's records in 2015. It became a, a way for Dr Dye to physicalise her findings and to share them with our team and with the visitors. It's also a great way to show how research, academic research, impacts on an institution and the wider public. This display developed further when volunteer Gillian Ford offered to use her skills in family history to look into more of the background of borrowers. We now have a borrower of the month. As you can see in this display here, our display case shows the extraordinary borrowing of a man called uh, Thomas Stalker, who is a gamekeeper um, living nearby. And he borrowed books over a 10 year period at Inner Peffrey and uh, reading every possible genre of book that was available to him from 17th century romantic poetry to late 19th century big game hunting. And it tells a visual story that we can develop with visitors, incorporates additional material from research such as newspaper cuttings, he won a shotgun competition, or maps um, showing where the borrower lived relative to the library. And all of these give us a conversation starting point um, with our visitors. Next month, we are hosting an outreach project with our partners in the Books and Borrowing project, which includes Stirling and Glasgow universities. Um, and that looks at the history of lending libraries across Scotland. And this not only involves people talking about research, but in includes some live shelf searching for books, um, uh, looking at the family names in the register. This event is online and free. So if you're interested, please do join us. Um, can I have another slide, please? Finally, I'd like to touch on a much larger initiative. Two years ago, we concluded um, a big capital project developing our outside space, and we wanted an event to launch it with the local community. A small 19th century book in our collection that you can see um, on the left-hand side of the panel is, is called Antiquities of Strathern, and it describes uh, the Lady Day Fair as a gay day at Inner Pef Ray in rather bad rhyme. Um, and it gives an exaggeratedly rustic description of a festival that took place annually. But it also described Inner Pef Ray as a place at the center of a rural community. And we wanted to recreate that. So we tried to recreate the fair with market stalls, 
uh, historic characters, music, games, storytelling, and transport. Now, we had no idea up until the day of the fair whether this would work, and we were delighted with our success, reaching 500 visitors in one day. And if I tell you that we usually reach 2,000 in a year, that gives you an idea of the scale that was for us. With this project, we also wanted to engage young people locally. We haven't been able to do that with a site visit because of the, the lockdown here in Scotland, but we did do it remotely and we got them to ask questions uh, that we could then put to heritage professionals and, and they could think about that as a career. So my final slide, please, and I'll, I'll wrap up for you. Uh, just to say, so these are some of the ways that we have linked with our audience and we try and forge further links with the local community. We use information and items in the collection that are founded in real experiences and speak to us because they're about real people and their everyday lives. And they also inspire and engage because they bring new knowledge and understanding. Most of all, they are based firmly in our founding value. In the abstract, well, you love libraries or books or history and you find it inspiring, exciting. But in the concrete, you have, your, you have known your family live in the area for years, but what more personal thing could you know about your great grandmother than the books you chose to borrow from the library? Both made the journey here. You share the experience of the visit and in your hand, you're holding the very same book that she held and you're connected. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was a wonderful story. Um, moving right along in the program, I'd like to hand over to um, Mel Callison. She is the Indigenous Strategies Librarian at the University of Manitoba, where she is working on a PhD related to Indigenous knowledges and cultural memory institutions. She is committed to advancing matters related to Indigenous peoples and creating meaningful change related to equality, diversity, and inclusivity within cultural memory professions. Camille serves as the chair of IFLA's Indigenous Matters section and is also a member of the Cultural Heritage Program Advisory Committee. So Camille, please take the floor. Greetings all. I just wanted to say hello and I'm sorry that I, I actually have a PowerPoint to show you, but I'm having really bad internet uh, connection issues. So I will um, just share uh, how we traditionally would have shared uh, today. So I want to say uh, welcome um, to all of you and thank you for attending um, this important uh, uh, discussion today. Uh, matters of cultural heritage important are um, critical to libraries and cultural memory institutions. I wanted to acknowledge that I am currently on um, and working for the um, uh, at the University of Manitoba whose campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples in the heart of the Red River Métis homelands. Um, and so part of that is to um, acknowledge where we are. And I think that that's the biggest part of what I wanted to uh, bring today is about creating relationships and how do we do that with our communities uh, to create a hub and a heart of um, cultural heritage um, uh, within our institutions. And so um, uh, coming to you from um, the IFLA Indigenous Matters section, which was created, um, uh, was formed from um, a special interest group into, um, into, a, um, into a section in um, 2017. And uh, part of the um, section's main purpose was to um, create, to, to support the provision of culturally responsive and effective uh, services to Indigenous communities throughout the world. And these are all available if you uh, want, would like to visit the IFLA Indigenous Matters um, section uh, page on IFLA. And part of our work is to seek to collaborate and connect with um, Indigenous communities and um, national uh, libraries, culture, knowledge, and information associations group, as well as the International Indigenous Librarians Forum, known as ILF, uh, which is where in 2009 uh, we were 
<clears throat> gathered at um, Otaki in uh, New Zealand, just north of Wellington, and we decided that we wanted to um, have a greater presence at IFLA Indigenous um, at, at IFLA and create an Indigenous Matters section uh, because we felt that there needed to be a voice for Indigenous peoples um, at IFLA. And so part of that is um, uh, moving forward the ideas of ensuring that there's cultural uh, relevance in uh, libraries. And part of the way that we do that is by acknowledging the Indigenous Peoples Territory or the Peoples Territory that we're on and to work with um, other cultures to create those meaningful expressions within our libraries, whether it's in signage. In North America, a lot of the work that we do is um, creating land acknowledgements, so the original Indigenous inhabitants, um, which I just uh, explained to you in a land acknowledgement where we're located. Uh, it's also about putting in art and training professionals in, uh, that are from Indigenous communities to work at, in our libraries and to be professionals in our communities. So there's many things that have been um, overlooked in sometimes in library training, which is inclusion of Indigenous perspectives and knowledges in our training systems when we go in to do our masters in library or archival or information studies um, that need to be included. So we want to empower libraries to inform um, <clears throat> to inform them, to inform their participant societies about Indigenous matters. And the way that we do that is by including Indigenous worldviews into libraries. So uh, part of this is created from my background, which would be considered a library in our territory. It's a picture of Tuskia Chokima. I'm from the Teletan Nation and uh, from Tuskia clan or um, a Crow clan of the Teltan Nation. Within this picture is a story of our creation. And so within this, we would say that um, this is Raven's house, and that is uh, described by uh, using the terminology Tuskia Cho Kima, so Tuskia, and Tuskia Cho would be a large crow, crow, so that's a raven, and Kima his house, so this would be Creator's house. And it's carved into the rocks of the Stikine Grand Canyon in Canada, which is located in northern BC and runs into um, at the mouth of the rivers at Wrangell, Alaska. Uh, so within this shows our stories, it shows our lineage, why we have two clans and we're matrilineal because two women uh, met at these banks of the Telta, confluence of the Telta and Stikine River. And within that shows the um, origin of our nation. Within this is what we would call a library. And we consider our elders to be our living libraries or living archives um, coming from Indigenous communities. So how do we then transform these into what modern institutions of libraries? Well, it is by having art that we can explain. It's by having um, acknowledgement of the land that we're on. It's by creating relationships with Indigenous communities. And I don't think I can say that enough. And that's part of our strategic direction is to work closely with Indigenous communities. It's by having elders come in to do story time. It's by creating um, appropriate terminology for Indigenous um, um, <clears throat> matters related to Indigenous people in our subject headings, in our classification systems, and how do we refer to Indigenous people. And the only way that we're going to be able to include Indigenous worldview and um, and uh, those concepts into libraries and cultural memory institutions is by actually going back and training uh, more Indigenous people to come into this profession, but also doing cross-cultural training where we work with each other to be able to create those uh, systems that will support uh, Indigenous worldview. Another one of the things that we like to talk about is Indigenous um, uh, ownership of our um, of our uh, knowledge and how that needs to be done. So if we went to uh, a presentation like this one, we would cite it appropriately. So when we're talking to Indigenous elders or storytellers, even if it is uh, shared with us orally, then we need to also cite that Indigenous knowledge. And it's really important to talk about those ownership issues, which uh, our section has um, 
uh, worked with in our first um, uh, special interest group co uh, convener uh, and myself. Um, so Lorraine Roy and I and uh, Gretchen Lechamont, one of uh, Lorraine's students, worked on a book talking about those different notions across the world of Indigenous ownership. Upcoming from our section is going to be um, uh, actually a workshop on um, uh, at, if, at IFLA's um, first virtual annual conference about relationships and why those authentic relationships matter. So it is about creating relationships with communities um, whose land you're situated on, but also communities that are existing there today that might not be um, uh, as, um, uh, they might be related to other countries, but they still have cultural expressions that we need to recognize and respect. And so it is really about looking at things with relationship, with respect, with having reciprocal relationships with people and having reference for their cultural and their ideas on how things should be done. And um, so one of the other things that's coming up from Indi uh, IFLA Indigenous Matters section is a uh, Indigenous Knowledge Journal, which should be out um, uh, sometime this spring uh, that's been worked on by um, uh, our um, our secretary, uh, Steve Stratton from Channel Islands, and he's been our, our main editor on that. So there's been a lot of work happening and we're hoping to have some webinars on some of these same issues moving forward, but that's a little bit about what we're trying to do at IFLA to create um, a voice for Indigenous peoples and to be able to uh, incorporate Indigenous worldview and to be that resource um, uh, for this type of work moving forward. So I hope I haven't gone over time, but thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and to share some of um, Indigenous worldviews. With thank you. you. Thank you, Camille, for sharing that um, perspective with us. Um, we will stay in Canada for our following speaker. I'd like to introduce Heidi Swaringa, um, Senior Conservator and Head of the Collections Care Management and Access Department at the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Her practice and research focuses on the use and activation of Indigenous belongings that are held in collections and the role that conservation profession plays in facilitating these activities. So Heidi, over to you. I'm going to start again. My timer doesn't start until I unmute. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you very much for including me here. I'm definitely the, the odd person out because I am uh, not a librarian. I don't represent a library. I am definitely a, a collections-based practitioner and a conservator. Um, the slide seems to be a bit... Uh, okay, so we'll... That's okay. Yeah, that it, I think they're a bit cut off, but I think we'll we'll make do here. Okay. Before I begin, um, begin, I just want to acknowledge that Moa sits on the unceded traditional territory of the Hunkalmenum speaking Musqueam people, and I also need to say that Musqueam, being on Musqueam territory, has privileged Moa to have a connection with a community that has shared its support and guidance for years. And this guidance has really impacted our museum practice, and for this, we are immensely thankful. And for those of you who don't know MOA, we're a medium-sized institution in Canada with just over 50,000 objects in the collection uh, from around the world. And the most significant portion of these are belongings that were taken from the Indigenous communities of Canada's Northwest Coast. As Claire said, I have been invited to talk with you today um, or share with you an object-focused example of community access and really the impactful results that can come out of this practice, both for community as well as for the institution. Um, sorry, Claire, I'm going to get you to bump over um, to the next slide. Um, this is just an image of uh, the inside of our multiversity gallery where we have a large on display gallery. And then the next slide, please. So access to the collections has been a critical part of MOA's mandate since the first community loan for use was done in the early 1980s. And it's really left us with a clear understanding of what is valuable, the value of the intangible, intangible beyond the physical object itself. And this understanding has really in turn strengthened MOA's capacity to do this work. Uh, the demand for which we are seeing is increasing exponentially, except in this, obviously in this last year of COVID. 
in the past five to 10 years or five to 10 years ago, we would have seen maybe one or two community loan requests a year, but now there's been a big increase. And I think really this has been because of the political and societal shifts in Canada relating to reconciliation and decolonization. As a bit of a background, I just wanted to let you know that we do a few different types of access visits. The one you're seeing here is for community groups or individuals who choose to visit belongings at MOA. And these visits uh, can be brief events or go over several days, depending on the number of objects that are requested. In order to reduce the financial barriers related to travel, we've set up a granting program that offsets the associated costs. Next slide, please. The next type of access uh, we do are study visits where groups of materials are brought to communities. And these visits um, are always community driven and they work well when there are elders who don't wish to travel to Vancouver or are not able to travel. And they're always reciprocal learning exchanges. We, in this one at the Squamish Little Cultural Center, uh, we learned a lot from the participants as they talked about their aunties and grandmothers that wove the baskets that we brought and they themselves were able to take uh, different lessons from the baskets that they can then incorporate within their own practice. Next slide, please. And the third type of access, which is the one I want to share, I hope I have time to share a couple stories with you, is the loan for activation. And in these instances, the belongings often serve as evidence of important hereditary rights or privileges, or even a claim to a specific area. And these are the loans that really push hard against the established museum standards since all the us usual requirements are dropped, right? Issues relating to environmental control, uh, handling procedures, site security, all are left out of the discussion when approving the loan. So it's, it's pretty clear that in order to accommodate these loan requests, it's helpful to align institutional practices with one of the key under principles, which is that Indigenous people have the right to manage and control their own material culture and information about that material culture, an idea which really requires a shift in the traditional balance of power between the institution and the borrower. And of course, it starts with a recognition, recognition that uh, there is a current power imbalance that exists between institution and community. Next slide, please. So the first example I wanted to show you here is the story of the Thunderbird headdress. It's a really a great example of the collaborative process between family and institution. Uh, this, I'm gonna actually just show you a map here. So next slide, and then we'll go back to this one. Uh, this headdress was acquired from the family in uh, the 1960s. Uh, in March of 2016, a request was made by the family of the original owner for the headdress to travel back to Alert Bay to be danced in a potlatch as a way of displaying the important hereditary privilege to the land that is embodied in this specific piece. So I just wanted to give you a geographical context. It, uh, from Moa to Cormoran Island, where Alert Bay is, it's about a seven hour journey door to door, so not that far. A uh, ferry ride, drive up the island highway, and then another ferry ride in the inset photo is the big house at Alert Bay where uh, the headdress would be danced. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. And then next slide, please. Great, so we're back to this one. And when a loan request like this is made, it starts off with a, with a great conversation that uh, incorporates a whole bunch of different people. And it will probably be uh, the family member who's making the loan request or a designate who's been selected on the part of the family to organize the logistics for the potlatch. Uh, there might be the artist who's been designated to work with conservation to make modifications uh, for use. Uh, and probably the dancer who's gonna be bringing the piece to life. And on the museum side, there would be uh, the conservator, loans manager, curator. And together we found that this collaborative process really works because there's inherent risks with, with use and the group together will decide if um, the piece is strong enough to be used. And, and if they decide not, then it might still travel for loan, but maybe just displayed instead of used. Next picture, please. So in this instance, I was um, privileged to be able to work with a late uh, Kwakwakawaka artist and hereditary chief Bo Dick to um, make the modifications for use. And uh, at first it was a decision of whether it was strong enough. Bo was a little bit unsure about that, but I was able to really make some good changes, make the wood more solid just with Japanese tissue paper and wheat starch paste. And then once he was happy with uh, the strength of it, then he proceeded to recreate the missing elements that he really felt needed to be in place in order to pay proper respect to the family and the headdress for it to be danced. 
and I worked on the rigging when we got to Alert Bay. Uh, we uh, did the fitting with Daryl Dawson, who was going to be dancing the headdress. And then afterwards, all the components came together the night before the potlatch, and we assembled them all for the next day. And next slide, please. And I just uh, wanted to point out that all of the changes that are made for use, as well as um, changes that might occur during the potlatch, so the materials come back smelling of the smoke of the big fire that, that burns, or maybe there might be some changes of the, the rigging, the strapping. All of these are retained as important evidence of, of use and uh, that go to show the ongoing life of the piece. And we've in fact altered our documentation so that these are recorded, noted as change as opposed to damage. Next slide, please. My second example here is a really powerful um, example for me of what can happen when we continue to push at our guidelines of professional, where, what, what's understood to be professional practice. Uh, this uh, uh, story starts with really a repatriation request. Ruby Dawson approached the museum to have her mother's blanket returned so that she could wear it in a family potlatch. And uh, because we're in a university, the machinery that's required to make this happen, it does take a while. So it wouldn't have worked out in time. So we let her know that there was this possibility of loan for use. And not only that, but we also had 11 other belongings that had come from her family. So it turned into a loan request and uh, she had decided that only the button blanket would be used. And we had yet to work out how, how all of the other materials would be um, brought out and displayed. But with this flexibility came actually a, a very wonderful occurrence where um, the, actually, let me have the next slide, please. Yep, and so it's just a, a minute or two, Heidi, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna, almost there. Mm -hmm. uh, the decision was made that the museum boxes would be brought out onto the floor and the family members themselves were the ones who opened the boxes of treasures and they removed the belongings and, and proceeded to process them around the room. We went back to the stands and then we were surprised a little while later to be summoned down to ask if the three masks that we had brought could be danced. Next slide, please. So three masks, normally we would prepare the masks in advance, so nothing had been done, but instead of saying that's impossible, we said, I turned the question around and said, well, what do you think? And together, next slide, please. It was a really wonderful occurrence. This is Alan Hunt, who was one of the dancers of the mask, who is unbundling the cedar bark that had never been unbundled before. He's reattaching it and making it stronger. New cedar skirts were attached as well. And they decided that it was possible. Next slide, please. And this is a short clip I just wanted to show cedar you. Cedar skirt off of the newer ones. Did you figure it out now? Yeah, this has got a... There's so no it's... I mean, it's here. here, I can see your hand there. See, that's the string. You just have to go through underneath the helmet like that, yeah. It's going to be that? right on your forehead. Hey, you hear that, Willie? Thank you. Next slide. Final slide. And I can't, I can't actually um, explain how uh, intense this was for, for everybody involved. And it was, I think, um, one of uh, the best parts of my working practice so far to see a belonging that had been stored in the museum for so long be brought back to life in this way. And this last image here is just to show um, one of the masks in the box waiting to go back to the museum, still retaining the eagle down that had been put on it, and it will stay there. And then I just wanted to show the post that Alan put out after the potlatch as a way of um, saying how important social media is to us to let people know that this occurrence is actually a possibility in the future. Thanks, and sorry for going a bit over time. Thank you so much for sharing those stories. I think we all can feel how powerful that experience was. Um, I would like to now turn to our final speaker, uh, Soledad Arbarca. She works at the National Library of Chile as the head of photographic and audiovisual collections, leading different projects as well as organizing exhibitions and publishing work about Chilean photography. She's a member of the Chilean Memory of the World Committee and coordinates the IFLA Preservation Conservation Center in Chile. So 
please, uh, Soledad, over to you. Hello. I, I would like to share, okay, here. It's, um, okay, thank you. First of all, I, I would like to thank the invitation to participate in this interesting panel, especially to Claire, who is always supporting us and sharing our outreach, outreach work through the IFLA PAC channels. The National Library of Chile has a long tradition and experience in bringing its heritage and collections to the community. It has always developed publication, talks, seminars, concerts, workshops, and exhibitions that take place normally <laughs> in our building, which is there, located in the center of Santiago in South America. These activities are organized by the special department of the institution and we participate uh, always in, in that programming. However, today I will focus on sharing the experience developed by the library's photographic and audiovisual archive, because since uh, 2017, we created a Facebook account to develop dissemination activities uh, based on our, our audiovisual work on the occasion of the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the department. Photographs, sound records, and moving image footage are of great interest to our researchers and users, and we think they have a great potential for communication and aesthetic enjoyment. Here is the, our last exhibition that we held uh, about a Japanese photographer uh, who uh, created a very long tradition photographic studio, and we show uh, we had the photographer as well as uh, activities showing the conservation treatments that we carry with the collection. But now we have this Facebook platform that was very useful uh, when the quarant long quarantine started in 2020 because of the COVID. So we had, we, have me we had meetings with the team and tried to focus on which things we should do during this long quarantine. So we established some objectives uh, like empowering our staff on the use of internet for communicating with users and general public, show and teach how to use our collections in terms of access, show a kind of a behind the scenes uh, what is our work like, design educational short videos about photographic and audiovisual collections, their history, physical characteristic and conservation issues, and give recommendations of best practices to preserve family photographs. One of the advantages that I, I have to comment is uh, that our team is uh, formed by quite young people, except me, <laughs> which made the proposal of immersing ourselves in tools to make videos at home very easy as well as the ease that we have today with cell phones and other mobile devices made this transition quite smooth. Likewise, many of them, they have excellent communication skills, which is, one, which is why one of the first ideas was to show how the archive works indoors. Each of the people share a video about their work, cataloging, digitizing and conserving, to name a few activities. This makes the users understand much better which are the processes that allow them to later access to our collections. Another issue that arose at this stage, it, that was uh, although our platforms of, for accessing digital collections are very good and contain thousands of documents, most users don't know, don't know that even exist. They don't know how to use it or how to find what they need. So we made videos to guiding users through, through the platforms. Another experience that we uh, 
wanted to show was uh, done during the National Heritage Day, which takes place every year in May. And, and we received thousands of people in the library. So uh, that last year we, uh, we were invited for uh, another uh, department of the library called Memory of the 20th Century. And we made an educational video to teach good practices in the care of family photographs. Since during the quarantine, we noticed many people dedicated themselves to ordering and discovering their family memories, for, we, for which it was very significant experience, which where, where we expanded the impact of these tutorials to a general, very broad public. That a photograph is me in my kitchen working with some albums that I have and showing like in a regular uh, environment we could do uh to we could take care of our family memories finally with the knowledge we experienced during the first months of the quarantine we came out with the idea to make a series of videos about the types of collections that we conserve their history and problems of conservation in order to better explain what people see for example albumen prints postcards and stereoscopic views these videos are directly related to accessible collections at the National Digital Library. And also during the month of photography, which is in August, we hold online talks to talk about each one of them. That those are the posters we, we made uh, with the events. We did something similar in October for the month of audiovisual heritage where we made videos about uh, videotapes, video VHAs, uh, cassette tapes, eight millimeter film and magnetic wire, along with carrying out a more interactive activity called Cassette Stories, where our users shared anecdotes about their collections of tapes, which was very successfully and entertaining. Another activity that has been very important in this period is the number of online meetings and seminars which we have been able to share experience with our professionals in Latin America. Within which we would like to highlight the Latin American po Poetry Repository Project carried out with, in conjunction with the Mexican Phonoteca and Radio Difusión del Uruguay where we premiered an audiovisual and sound records by Gabriela Mistral to celebrate her uh, 70 year uh, Nobel Prize. And to finish, I would like to add some, uh, some notes about uh, comments about all these activities. First of all, we have generated a positive impact on the queries of our access platforms. Uh, the numbers were very positive. Uh, and, and we were amazed how these activity, little activities and, and posts helped to uh, help people to guide them through our collections and it was very successful. They, they have been made without any additional budget. Our national budgets were cut very, very heavily uh, and only with technological solutions available in our homes. Uh, we, I take credit, uh, my, my, my team is very creative and very uh, compromised with these uh, activities. Uh, it has created a community around our followers that has grown a lot. We have learned a lot about communicating and engaging others in the preservation of audiovisual archives uh, and heritage. Uh, some of them have problems of uh, machines you need or uh, obsolescence uh, of technology. So it's very important to guide people to, to, to care about them and, and try to bring people uh, to the library to learn how to deal with these kind of materials that usually you cannot see, for example, a film image. And at last, not it, it, it's very important to, to say that we learn and, and being inspired by other librarians and institutions that we admire a lot. And we visit all websites to create, you know, our own strategy based on what we see and what is going on in the library field. So 
That will be my presentation. That this picture, we will share it tomorrow for the International Day of the Book. <laughs> uh, so we we try to use our images uh, with creativity to bring people to our library uh, in this COVID time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Soledad. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers for sharing very different um, looks into your work and how you interact with both the collections in your institutions and um, with the people who visit your institutions, as well as people in the, the larger community um, nearby where you live and beyond. So now I want to take um, a few minutes to open up a discussion um, to help our, encourage our attendees here today to consider how they can explore ways in their own practice and within their own context to encourage engagement with cultural heritage. And as time is quite short, I have just one question to get us thinking in this direction. And that is, what is your advice to librarians or others working in mem memory institutions? Um, what is your advice on how to begin integrating community engagement with, with cultural heritage and with collections in their work? So um, maybe if I, if, if you can, um, if you may, I might go back through the order of, of, our, of our speakers, just, just to hear um, a little bit if you have any insight. And um, so Lara, can I can I hand back to you with that question? Yes, of course. And what uh, I'd just love to say how um, inspiring I found everyone else's um, presentations. Of course, I've now given myself a <laughs> cough. <laughs> um, for me, the it's whatever inspires you and whatever inspires your team, um, what is interesting, what is quirky, unusual, what is human in your collection it is a really great starting point. And that's what, what started me off um, with a, a big room full of brown books um, that you have to make exciting. Um, we're very lucky here at Inner Peffrey because we are able to handle the books and you know, to, to physically touch them uh, and to let visitors do that as well. So um, that does help. Um, with the with getting people engaged with it, but um, I, I think that it always goes down to what you find exciting. Will somebody else will find exciting too? Definitely, starting with that your own passion, and and that helps others feel it too. Um, and Phil, you you spoke about the importance of building those connections and building those relationships. Um, would you what what would your advice be? To, to someone to, to get started on, on facilitating or building up on those relationships? So I think um, when, we're, when your focus is on relationality with the community and uh, what they uh, would like, but also too, so if you are working with um, cultural heritage, you should need to go back and ask the community. And I think that that's the most important thing is creating that relationship. Also to um, having them uh, have a seat at the table and a voice in the decision making. Some of the uh, work can only be done when we hear from them and often it delays the uh, work that we're, we're trying to create if it's projects or uh, incredible exhibits or um, uh, uh, national awareness or where even um, uh, public relations promotions that we want to do if we don't have their voice. And so we're always continually going back and asking them, but if we involve them in the process from the beginning, Indigenous people in Canada uh, have coined a saying, nothing about us without us, and that needs to start at the beginning. And so those relationships are foundational. So how do we make them? It is by reaching out and stepping out of our culture, uh, out of our cultural heritage, out of our comfort zones, which is our little safe space as um, uh, people who work in library and archives, but actually going out and talking to those communities whose um, cultural heritage that you have. So that would be uh, my main advice moving forward. Thank you. Um, definitely important just getting it going out of the front door and, and making sure there's there's space there. Um, to, there. You're making sure you're making space, I think. Um, Heidi, can I turn back to you um, with, the, with the same question and advice to begin integrating 
um, engagement with collections. I just want to echo what Camille said. Sorry, that's got, just got very loud in my house right now. So I apologize. Um, um, Camille, I just wanted to support what you have said and it's all very important information. So I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, one of the things that we have learned at MOA is we have really a responsibility to step up our game a little bit. And while we may have been doing a lot of these things for a long time, uh, we have we still have a lot of work to do and part of that is making sure that um, we're reducing the barriers for access and there are many 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 different types of barriers and one of the ones that really practically speaking is easy to address is the financial barriers so we've worked really hard uh, trying to organize uh, financial support so that we can make the connections or people can make the connections if they choose to do so so that it, it, it levels things a little bit. Um, the other challenge that we have a lot is, is so, so much of the information has been lost. Belongings have been removed from communities for so long and there's been a sever of that connection. So like, the story that I shared, people don't even know where their belongings are. And so we have a responsibility to be more accurate about the documentation of our own collections so we can get the work, word out so people people know. And that, that's not just about borrowing, that's about repatriation, right? How do you, how do you instigate a repatriation correct request if you don't know where your family's things are? And part of that is about uh, access. So I'm, I'm, I'm so I don't speak library speak, <laughs> so, but I know what we call things, what we classify things as, the lexicons that we use are all really important to look at because how things have been called for a long time aren't how people, doesn't help because you can't find them that way. Um, yeah, I, I certainly think from, I don't think there's that big of a divide in that sense between libraries and, and museums. So I think that that is a very, a very relevant piece of information of the language we're using to describe things and in the information um, profession, you know, that's, that's a really a big background of our, of our work. Um, and so that you, you spoke to these, these programs you put on in, in extremely challenging times and showed that you can still, you can still do this, you can still create these sorts of connections and this outreach even among challenges that many of us wouldn't have expected a few years ago. So can you, can you, can I turn that same question over to you of, of what, what would your advice be to, to get started? Well, I agree with Lara that uh, in, in our case, the key is knowing and loving our collections because everything is there. Uh, if you have a quirky, you said <laughs> that term is, is nice. Uh, quirky photograph uh, and show to the people and, and make connections always will speak to you. I, I think in, 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 in my case uh, is kind of easy because uh, photographs are part of uh, everyone. So uh, what we have, it's part of every Chilean people person. So it's, it's easy to relate, but uh, we in, in some we have kind of a bad um, reputation in libraries that we are very close. We're also very uh, boring people. And we discover that we are fun people. We are very cool. <laughs> and we enjoy doing that. I, I, I really, I enjoy my work. I love conservation, for example. I follow many conservators. They're really fun. They make, you know, sculptures with, cotton gloves and stuff like that and show people that we are very privileged because we are ha we have the contact with collections that are very valuable but in a way that being you know uh, in connection with the people you discover there is a link and that you can have fun with it you know it's not like we're you know clowns or anything but uh, showing what you do helps people to value uh, what you are taking care of, you know, to see that I, I show the library building. It's a very like palace 
very close to the people, but when people discover what what's uh, what we do inside, they feel uh, privileged to be there and and happy that you know our country has it. So yes, I, I believe um, maybe it's kind of <laughs> uh, we really have to show that we love uh, our collections, we love our heritage. And people will start loving it as well. I don't know. It's very <laughs> sentimental. <laughs> very sentimental, but uh, we discover that and, and 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 people, you know, going through their family albums during quarantine, many people sharing their pictures. And it was an opportunity to say, you know, if you're doing it. Don't do it with greasy hands, you know. Uh, and 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 that was nice, and and we felt um, important as well. So I think that made a. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. There's a bit of a lag, um, but I think you've touched on an important point that Heidi also touched on in her um, presentation is storytelling about what you're doing, and social media is one outlet for that. But um, but that showing, showing the meaningful stories um, and showing the meaningful interaction um, is just a really important part of that sort of outreach and that can build and that can, can spread the word. So I think those are all really important sentiments and I think that's a good place to, to bring our event to, to an end. So I want to, um, on behalf of IFLA and the the Cultural Heritage Program Advisory Committee. I really want to thank our four speakers for being here today and sharing these really powerful stories and um, experiences with us. And I want to thank everyone that joined us today for being here. Um, and if you have any questions or you're, you're curious about how you can integrate cultural heritage um, protection, access, and engagement in your own work, be sure to follow IFLA's Cultural Heritage Program in our different sections uh, for much more inspiration and information. So on that note, thank you to everybody and goodbye. Thank you.